Welcome to the OR Today webinar series. We're excited to have over 125 registered attendees for today's webinar. Just a reminder to save the date for our fifth annual OR Today Live Surgical Conference 2019, which will take place on August 18th through 20th at the Palms Casino Resort and Spa in Las Vegas, Nevada. Join us to discover new opportunities, broaden your knowledge, and exchange ideas. Registration is open, and for additional information, you can visit ortodaylive.com. Let's kick off today's webinar by giving an OR Today Live surprise pack to the attendee that can tell me the answer to the following trivia question. Sunday is National Wine Day. Which day produces the most grapes? Answer now using the question feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to remind you that today's webinar is eligible for one continuing education hour. Uh, to obtain your certificate, you do need to complete the post-webinar survey that will be sent to you or that will be appear on your screen immediately following today's broadcast. One lucky attendee will have the opportunity to win an Amazon gift card courtesy of OR Today just for completing the survey. All right, let's see who today's lucky winner is for the OR Today Live Surprise Pack. Congratulations to George Koff. George, you were the first to give us the correct answer of California. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, Microsystems. Microsystems delivers software solutions for managing the demands of the modern sterile processing department. Microsystem remains the industry leader and will bring actionable intelligence to your sterile processing operation. Learn more about this company, today's sponsor for the webinar, by visiting their website, mmmicrosystems.com. All right, let's introduce our presenters today. Our presenters are going to be Elizabeth Betsy Vane, health science teacher at Health Careers High School, San Antonio, Texas, and Deborah Debbie Austin, Health Department Coordinator, also at Health Careers High School. Debbie, you may begin whenever you are ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us today on the webinar. We're gonna try to give you an overview of how we established a high school sterile processing program, kind of the history of it, uh, some of the clinical and legal um, considerations uh, for starting a program, uh, some of the roles and functions that um, we see uh, our students uh, accomplishing in the healthcare field, and the importance of having the school district um, support our program, our certification program uh, by payment for the students to take the tests, and then support for the time that they take uh, out of school to take those tests. Our goals when we started looking at uh, a sterile processing program for students, it didn't start out that way and we'll kind of cover that a little bit in the history, but we thought it was very important to offer students uh, something else outside of the classroom that they could use out in the community. And uh, so we provide a hands-on, our goals are to provide that hands-on experience with our partnerships in the healthcare facilities. We use two large healthcare facilities, uh, the VA hospital and our Bear County uh, Hospital University Hospital as training. They're both training facilities to begin with. The other thing uh, is that we, we thought it was important to train students uh, because we noticed there is a very critical shortage of sterile processing. It seems to be a kind of a swinging door in the hospital is hard to get them oriented and keep them for long periods of time. So um, uh, we thought it was important to fill in that gap and kind of provide something for the community and the students uh, work uh, in the field um, as they're going to college. So we are a publicly funded magnet high school for healthcare professions, and we are conveniently located in the heart of the South Texas Medical Center area in San Antonio, Texas. And on the map, you can see we're about six minutes from the hospitals, um, and both hospitals are very, very supportive of our students. 
Our school was established in 1984 on land donated by the Bear County Medical Foundation for the purpose of educating students from across Bear County and the surrounding area, which today includes 17 different districts. Uh, students must have an interest in health careers, a complete eighth grade, have at least a C average in core subject, subjects, satisfactory conduct, attendance, and standardized test scores, and students must make application and be selected for entrance. Our entire student body is approximately 850 some students. About 250 new students come every year out of about 1,000 or more applications. Our SPD course is a practicum double blocked career and technical education course open to seniors. The students write their applications at the end of their junior year to try to be accepted into this practicum. Here's a, you're looking at a timeline, just an approximate timeline here of how the program got started. It, it didn't start out as a sterile processing program initially in the 1990s. Um, it was an on-campus course and it was designed to talk about the operating room field itself. So we taught the um, skills and knowledge related to the operating room, such as surgical scrubbing, gowning, gloving, uh, instrumentation, and sterilization. So the skills were already being taught in a, in a course. It started out a year long, it went to a semester long, then it went back to a year long program. So I began um, looking around, what else could I offer students, uh, you know, besides just classroom teaching? And we already had clinical programs in, in progress and in place with the hospitals. I thought, well, let me just uh, test that out. <laughs> so I started talking with people and uh, we started testing uh, with the Department of Veterans Affairs in 1997 and 1998. That was my first time to uh, test students uh, and we had a pretty good success rate. We had anywhere from 79 to 93 percent pass rate there. Uh, but in 2007 uh, is when we started teaching the, um, the curriculum through the Certification Board of Sterile Processing Distribution and also with ISHM. So we used both of those curriculums uh, to teach uh, our students. Uh, from about 2007 to last year, uh, we're still in the process of testing this year. We have three students testing today and then we'll have our pass rate. But we've had, um, we've tested a, a total of about 180 students with an overall pass rate of 99%. So um, they're, they're very capable of uh, doing the work in the hospital. They've uh, proven themselves. We've proven with a pass rate a successful pass rate. And so we continue to do that and just build on it each year. Uh, the first seven weeks, students uh, stay on campus. We feel that it's very important here at Health Careers to, uh, on any of our clinical students going over to the hospital, that they're well prepared or overly prepared uh, to be uh, working alongside healthcare professionals. So we teach, um, there's required uh, content that we teach, and we'll cover a little bit more of this later in the program, but fire safety, HIPAA, certainly confidentiality, even though they're in sterile processing, they are going out and they are not in surgery and they are in endoscopy places like that where they have to be confidential with patient information. So we teach that. We teach infection prevention, you know, where they have to know their hand washing, uh, they have to know uh, what kind of PPE re is required for, especially for decontam and the prep and pack areas. OSHA bloodborne pathogens, very important before they get to the healthcare facility. And of course, instrumentation. We'll, we'll talk about the curriculum here um, on the next slide. So our curriculum covers the basics for working in each area of sterile processing. We also include human anatomy and physiology to better understand how instruments are designed, 
how they are used, how they're properly cleaned, disinfected, assembled, sterilized, stored, and distributed. Our school district, as Debbie mentioned before, pays for qualifying students to take the National SPD certification exam. That usually happens in May, and then they're going to be on course to graduate in June. So students can be nationally certified in sterile processing and distribution before they graduate high school. And our goal is to provide real life work experiences and positively influence the next generation of healthcare workers. Okay, some of the legal requirements, um, we have affiliation agreements with all of the healthcare facilities that we use, mainly right now with sterile processing, we use the two facilities. So we have affiliation agreements with them. And in compliance with that agreement, we are, um, we are responsible for uh, developing policies and procedures in our orientation for the students prior to getting to the hospital. So um, we, we have, um, these guide the students uh, in their, uh, as far as their conduct, their dress, and travel to and from the healthcare facility. Um, our policies and procedures are very strict. Uh, we like uh, to maintain a very professional behavior with the students. Uh, they also attend a formal orientation with the healthcare facilities that we go to. So they actually get a double kind of orientation of topics, especially the ones that I mentioned earlier. Uh, each hospital requires that we maintain uh, current immunization records on all students, so they have to be up to date on all of their um, childhood immunizations as well as uh, their tetanus and uh, a seasonal flu vaccine. We retain those records here at the school, so uh, and we provide those to the uh, occupational health nurses at the facility when uh, upon request. Um, all our, our Northside Independent School District requires that each student have a history and physical each year so that, that we know that they are healthy enough to participate in the program. Uh, our health, our uh, school district, excuse me, uh, Northside Independent school, school District carries a $2 million uh, insurance and liability po policy for students and instructors when they are at the facility. We also are requested with our affiliation agreements uh, that the students have their own personal health insurance. So if anything happens, uh, uh, they take their, their insurance card there at the facility. Uh, it, um, if the students don't have their personal health insurance, we do require them to take the student accident insurance with the uh, uh, with the school district. So they have to have some kind of personal health or accident insurance to meet those affiliation agreements. Um, if they're at a hospital, say for instance the VA hospital, if they're over 18 years of age, they require them to have to be fingerprinted. Um, so we have to fill out paperwork for that. Uh, HIPAA training, very important. Uh, you know, some hospitals require us to um, fill out extra forms saying that we did, we have heard the policies of the hospital concerning HIPAA and confidentiality, which we do that. Okay, students wear their, um, uh, stu students have to wear their photo badge, which is also given to them during the orientation period. We go through their, um, their, I guess their security, uh, where they take their photo and they provide them with a badge that they have to wear every day at the hospital. Teachers are required to be on site with uh, each student every day. Um, most, both of us uh, work with our students. We, we dress out, we go down to the sterile processing area with our students and work alongside them with professionals. Uh, the last thing on here is the TB skin test. It depends on which healthcare facility we're at. Uh, one facility requires just a single PPD test. Um, 
and that it be negative. Uh, if it is positive, then we go through their occupational health and they have um, the steps that we need to take to clear them. Uh, over at the VA, they follow the CDC guidelines of two PPDs, um, two negative PPDs. Uh, if they have a positive PPD on the second one, then um, they require blood testing and they pay for that for the students to in order, and that has to be cleared before they can volunteer. So as Ms. Austin has said, we very much stress professional requirements. And also we start school usually the end of August and we very much are preparing them before we set foot in the hospital. And that would occur about mid-October and the students travel to the hospitals two times per week for three hour blocks. So at the end of the school year, students clock in about 120 or 130 hours for that year. So we remain on campus twice a month for classroom teaching or student presentations or guest speakers and of course testing. So this curriculum provides a foundation for them to build on real life skills that they then practice in the clinical setting. And in order to provide real life and safe experiences for our students, we have developed these strict policies and procedures because that will reinforce professionalism, positive demeanor and ethical behavior. And I wanted to take a minute to read to you our mission of Health Careers High School. And that is to equip students to serve their communities with compassion, integrity, and excellence by engaging them with a rigorous and comprehensive academic program focused on an exploration of health professions and real world applications of medical knowledge and skills. And additionally, the mission of our Northside Independent School District Career and Technical Education is to provide Northside students with opportunities to learn coherent, rigorous content that is aligned with challenging academic standards and relevant technical knowledge essential for career and college res uh, readiness. Um, one of the things of uh, professional requirements um, that we actually have developed and require of our students uh, is the parental permission uh, for the students to participate in the program. Um, the, we've revised this uh, statement that's pulled out of this uh, parental permission because we wanted to make sure that it's clear to the parent what the students are going to be around and what uh, they're involved in over at the healthcare facility because it goes a little bit beyond our regular clinical uh, programs because they are um, around um, blood and body fluids uh, as they are rotating through the decontamination area of the hospital. They're in surgery observing, they're in endoscopy observing. So it's, uh, they have that potential for exposure to blood and body fluids. So we make sure that we, um, the parents understand. So if there's any problem at, up front, uh, they are asked to sign this the first week of school. And if there's any hesitation on the part of the parent, then we counsel them that maybe they would like to remove their student from the program or you know, pick another uh, on-campus program that might be better suited for the student. But we do follow OSHA guidelines. We do follow standard precautions. Uh, all infection control procedures are taught. And we protect the student at, at all costs. Um, we go over uh, how to protect themselves in the healthcare facility while they're there. We un they understand that it is mandatory and that um, they don't have a choice of following what PPE has to be worn in certain areas. We make that real clear. Uh, this statement's been revised. Uh, VA kind of helped me. They wanted it to be very specific so that the parents know exactly what the students are getting into as far as the program. Okay, the next slide, it just talks about a day in the life of one of our students. Uh, like Betsy said, we go two days a week um, 
I go every day because I have two programs, so they alternate with each other. So we go Monday through Thursday, two programs. Um, we, uh, our professional standards, again, are very strict. Um, <laughs> we, you know, uh, before we even leave the school, we make sure that the students have a, uh, their uniform, their scrubs, as you can see, the, we wear the galaxy blue scrubs. And that was suggested by our uh, uniform place because we were trying to be different than the nurses at the hospitals we were going to. We didn't want to wear the same color so that the students were being confused with nursing personnel. So we uh, chose the Galaxy Blue Scrubs. So they wear those. We make sure that they're pressed every day, that the shirts are tucked in uh, to the bottom, that their shoes are, are white, clean, uh, polished, clean socks, you know, they have their photo ID badge. We keep, we retain those photo ID badges every day and give them out to the, to the students and take them back up because um, BA hospital requires a police report if their badge is, is lost or stolen. Uh, so we, we retain those so that we know they have them every day. Uh, we require them to keep some kind of notebook and pen in their pocket so that if they're given information by one of their supervisors, say um, a code to get into a uh, get into an area or steps in doing performing something, you know, that they can put that down in their notebook. Also, we do journaling. Each day the students are required to journal what they uh, observed, what they um, you know, maybe did for the day, you know, so that they can write about their experience. Of course, not using any names or, or any patient information. The hair has to be up uh, off of the collar. Uh, that includes males, okay? Uh, so we don't require, we don't let them have very long hair. Uh, their sideburns have to be uh, the middle of their ear. They have to be freshly shaven. Uh, no jewelry and certainly no cell phones. We don't allow them to be talking on their phone. Uh, that's unprofessional at the healthcare facility. So we control the cell phones. So our two clinical uh, instructors are uh, Debbie, who does have two classes at the VA hospital. And then myself, I have one class at University Hospital. So uh, lucky Debbie gets to ride the bus with me <laughs> <laughs> on the mornings here. So uh, clinical instructors' responsibilities then mm -hmm. on our days that we are going to the hospital, which for each class is at least twice a week, uh, we're responsible to hand out those photo badges. We carry the students' immunization records, the parents' phone numbers, the <laughs> health insurance, um, and students' uh, immunization records, and of course, if they have any allergies. And we do this just in case information is needed due to accidents or fainting. And clinical instructors are also accountable for the student safely traveling by yellow school bus. That is the only way we travel is in a yellow school bus. And um, the high school does provide us with insurance, as Debbie had said, and we can also buy additional insurance as instructors if that would make us uh, more comfortable. Our clinical sites, um, we have worked really hard in providing uh, great clinical sites for our students that kind of go along uh, and support the uh, sterile processing. Uh, they have uh, five rotations throughout the year they last about five to six weeks, depending on, you know, the holidays in there, kind of uh, mess with some of our our rotations. Um, we do have them rotate through uh, decontamination, preparation and packaging, sterilization, instrument coordinator uh, at some facilities, like a uh, university has one of those, and so they, she places a student with that instrument coordinator. Logistics surgery, endoscopy. Over at VA, we use the orthopedic clinic, clinic, uh, clinic because we, op we, uh, we put up a lot of the orthopedic uh, instruments. Uh, so we start mid-October, then we do our rotations. Um, 
Some of the units, as, as you can see, would only be observation only. Uh, surgery, endoscopy, those are observation only. The students know that up front, that they're not allowed to scrub in or to do anything. They do assist occasionally with the tying of the um, surgeon's gowns. <laughs> They've asked them to participate there. They will ask them to move closer in surgery so they can observe, uh, you know, closer. Uh, endoscopy. Uh, they've been allowed to look down the scopes to see what the surgeon is looking at. Orthopedic clinic, they will assist, um, you know, the technicians in helping to prep uh, patients for uh, injections, um, listen in on consultations uh, for patients. Uh, and then some like our um, decontam, prep and packaging and sterilization, we do have the students re uh, you know, they do some of the skills, they help with the cleaning of the instruments, loading of the washer sterilizers. There are tasks that they can do. In preparation and packaging, uh, they're allowed to help um, put together surgical trays of instruments according to the account sheets. Uh, they are always checked by a team leader or supervisor. I check them, then the supervisor checks them before they're even uh, put onto the rack for sterilization. So they're a lot of skills and we do practice those skills and we'll show you some pictures here shortly of some of the students in the areas. Um, we practice those packaging skills at the school before we get over to the healthcare facility. Plus the students learn about a hundred instruments prior to going to the hospital so that they have some base knowledge in putting a tray together. So this is an example of a task sheet and task sheets are where you can mark if you were observing or performing a task and the student would be assigned to an area for five to six weeks. So this particular task sheet here is for the decontamination area and it really is several pages long, but we wanted to show you part of it on the slide in this fashion. Um, this is a great conversation starter when working with a variety of employees because it keeps the students on task and it gives them something to say. Uh, could you please help me today? I, need, I would like to do these four or five or six uh, things on the sheet. Um, the leadership in SPD works with us to keep these task sheets updated and current with their equipment and their procedures. This particular task sheet is for the logistics or supply area and it was designed with the leadership of that department. And again, students obtain marks for observing or performing a variety of tasks. And the hospital staff then initials and dates the form during the five to six ro um, week rotation. And at the end, the students turn them into us and then we can give them a grade. And if you happen to lose your task sheet or you have your younger siblings color all over them, or it fell out of the van and you drove over it and there's tire tracks, then you have a lower grade. If you lose it completely, you lose professional standard points. And the reason for that is we understand the staff are busy and you may not see that person again, they're on a different shift and now you've asked them to doubly take their time signing your sheet. So one more example here would be in our prep and pack or assembly area. And this would be another uh, set of observations or performances that students would need to do to fully understand this important area of SPD. Yeah, the students get about 100 to 130 hours for the year uh, before they uh, sit for the exam. Uh, one of the other uh, documents that they have to carry with them is a basic fact sheet. This, uh, each rotation, the students are required to complete information relating to the unit that they're in. Uh, information that's usually required is that we want them to know their supervisor's number and how to reach them if they are absent. Uh, we do require them to call in just like if they were regular employee. Uh, we want them to know the fire codes, uh, fire exits, fire alarms and extinguishers, uh, where they're located, how to get out in case of fire. We do practice that. We ask them to verbalize that on their sheet. 
we want them to know a little bit about who are the people who work in the area? Who are the healthcare workers? What are their titles um, and their duties? Um, and also, what are the services provided in each of the areas that they're in? Uh, plus, the, a big one uh, that kind of correlates with what we trained them on, the standard precautions in each unit. What are the standard precautions? How do they, uh, what is a potential means of transmission for blood and body fluids in this area? And how do, can they protect themselves um, in their area that they're in? So here are photos of our high school classroom in action. And this is the instruction that happens between the end of August and the middle of October. And of course we do this before we set foot in the hospital so students are safe and the hospital employees know that our students have a foundation regarding SPD skills. So this is Miss Austin uh, showing students how to don and doff PPE and sequentially wrap small basins and then you see the students learning families of instruments along with individual names or nicknames, which can be great fun. And then this uh, going along with our classroom, this is another view of our classroom. We're fortunate to have scrub sinks, an ultrasonic unit, and an in-the-wall steam autoclave for hands-on learning in one of our lab rooms at our high school. And this provides some familiarization for our students so they're comfortable in a stainless steel and steam real work environment. And the next picture is students uh, boarding and um, getting off the bus to and from the healthcare facility. Once again, we do require them to ride the school bus. Uh, the healthcare facilities due to uh, overcrowding in the parking lots do not allow any kind of professional students, even nursing students uh, to uh, park their cars there. So they all have to be um, to go by bus. They can't be, we don't allow them to drop off. So if they have um, a doctor's appointment or something like this, which we discourage during our clinical time, then uh, they have to stay back at the, at the school. We don't allow them to be dropped off. Students, it requires students, uh, we know, they know what time that we pick up. They know what time they have to be out of the unit. Um, you know, when they have to doff their, uh, equipment and enough time to get check it in and get to the bus so it requires some you know some planning on their part the next one is uh, once we get to the healthcare facility they have to pick up their scrubs this is a picture of uh, some of the students getting their scrubs from the scrub machines uh, at university hospital um, and they're a little bit different uh, we carry scrub cards that we are allowed uh, the instructors carry the the scrub cards and we check out the scrubs and we check in the scrubs each day that the students are there. So this slide depicts students donning PPE and working in the decon area. Uh, both of us assign two students to decon for every clinical rotation cycle and occasionally both of us have to put more than two in decon uh, such as when the cart washer is down and carts need to be manually cleaned and disinfected. Uh, but for usual clinical days, we have two students each in decon. And these are the types of photos that capture students' and parents' attention on elective fair events, the school open house events, in the school yearbook, and we put them in Google Classroom. And I'm sort of jealous because I never had this type of opportunity when I was in high school. And here are more pictures in um, DECON again. These slides were using the regular ultrasonic unit and the cannulated ultrasonic unit for the robotic laparoscopic instruments. And students learn the intricacies of these ultrasonic units, the importance of the lid closing properly, degassing before use, correctly attaching the flushing port attachments, and following the manufacturer's IFUs. And again, more decon photos of our students hard at, hard at work. You can see uh, the yellow medical air hose in the top left photo and IFUs on the sink walls and the walls near the cannulated ultrasonic unit for easy reading and use. And graduates of our SPD program tell us how thankful they are for the academic book learning 
paired with the real world hands-on learning that this practicum offers them. They are learning skills behind the scenes that provide them not only what to do, but the reasons why they are doing them. And here we have more pictures. Um, let me find my notes here. Uh, they are running the AER unit and they are getting ready to load the washer. Okay, we have students in the prep and pack areas where we emphasize inspection of instruments as being the biggest thing before you put a tray together. Everything has to be inspected for blood, uh, bile burden, uh, anything uh, for function. So we stress that to our students uh, while they're assembling the trays uh, with account sheets. Um, I, once again, all students who are working with trays, they always usually have a buddy system where we have someone who is checking us. I work with the students, I know Ms. Vane does, uh, where um, they're putting the instruments in order uh, before the team leader checks that. So we put them in order, we check them for function, we check all the um, cannulated uh, instruments, insulated instruments, everything has to be checked before we have it checked off and assemble the tray. Okay, and here's some more pictures of uh, students uh, checking instruments. Again, uh, the students are taught how to properly check the insulation on laparoscopic instruments. And here's some more pictures that we've taken of students assembling a book walter retractor. Uh, in the, uh, students are taught in the classroom how to prepare a tray for sterilization before coming to the hospital. So you see one of our students wrapping uh, uh, a tray. And again, uh, here's more of the same of the students checking instruments, putting them in order against the count sheets. And now we're moving into sterilization and the students are scanning the load contents and preparing to push the load into the autoclave. Students learn all the important details of high temperature and low temperature sterilization, and that may take more than one clinical rotation, but luckily they continue to learn about sterilization while they're in the prep and pack assembly area, when they're handling cooled loads for sterile storage. And we're very um, happy that they can do these tasks. And here we have the low temperature and the high temperature uh, processes that they can learn about during their hands-on portion of their assignments. One of the other areas that they rotate through is the supply and logistics area of the hospital. Uh, very important uh, for them, they learn how to check out dates. Um, they clean the shelves for the employees. They pull tickets for the departments and they deliver supplies all over the hospital uh, to various departments. And here's some more pictures of them checking the integrity of the packages. That's another very important skill and task that they learn. So in shadowing the instrument instrument coordinator, this is a task sheet uh, section that has three or four pages because the instrument coordinator position is responsible for ordering new instruments, sending out instruments for repair or sharpening, and also procuring instruments such as loaner instrument sets. So in this rotation, our stu students see firsthand how to properly unpack, account for, file the hard copies of the IFUs and more related to new and repaired surgical instruments. And then we get the joy of breaking down cardboard and other packing materials and disposing of them properly in large traps or recycled containers. And lastly, our last two slides, just kind of give you an idea. This is a former student who is now an employee of a facility that we use. So She's now involved in helping with the training of our students when they come in. So it's one of our students here. Uh, we have uh, students that have, are employed all over the city in the Methodist healthcare system, the Christus Santa Rosa healthcare system, university health system. 
And uh, Ms. Bain and I constantly network when we go to conferences or in services uh, in the city with uh, the SPD, um, you know, uh, supervisors so that we can help uh, get students into the facility, even the ones that we're not using where we can um, further say where we've not been before, we might um, you know, be able to get uh, students jobs in those areas. And the last one here is just some, uh, I won't read those to you, but these are two past students that also work at the hospital and they wanted uh, everyone to know how significant they thought our program was for them. They're still working there uh, after, uh, after while they're in college. So that's all we have um, on our presentation. So I guess we'll open it up for questions. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for the presentation so far, ladies. And while you were busy presenting the information, the attendees were busy asking some questions. So I'm going to jump right into it, but I do want to remind all attendees, you can continue to submit your questions using the question feature on your webinar dashboard. We're going to get through as many as time allows, uh, but all questions will be sent to our presenters today for them to follow up with you offline. All right, Betsy and Debbie, I'm just going to read the questions. I will allow either of you to jump in and decide who's going to answer. Okay. The first question we want to address, how many hours do your students spend at the hospital SBD departments during a school year? Approximately 100 to 130. If they have something that interferes and they uh, are absent that day, they might not have as many. But I have students already clocking in 134 hours so far. That is awesome. And what type of academic grades are taken during the school year? And what type of hands-on grades are given or taken? Well, the basic facts sheet that you saw, that would be due the third clinical day or so, or maybe the fourth. That was with the fire extinguishers and what kind of um, people work in that unit and what services are provided. That is a like a regular kind of daily grade. There are grades for the task sheets. We have worksheets, we have quizzes, we have tests. The professional standards is actually a test grade. It is 100 points. It's for each of our semesters. So if your shirt is untucked or your shoes are not white or you don't have white socks of the right length, if you're not wearing a watch, you will have minus eight for each infraction. If your hair is not up, if you didn't shave, if you were wearing jewelry, um, all manner of things, which sounds rather draconian, but um, it is minus eight, and that is a test grade. And students at our school are very, very conscious of their grades. We're very fortunate. They wish to do this type of work. Uh, the discipline problem really is not there, but you still might forget to shave or keep your earrings in. So what other grades would we have? Well, we, uh, at the end of each of the units, we always have a unit test. So we test them over the information and we want them to be competent in the information. So uh, before they go over to the hospital. So, and we constantly test during throughout the year. Perfect. Here's a question from an attendee. How many clinical hours are required before you sit for the boards? Well, the, um, the two groups that offer the SPD certification have their requirements. So I believe one requires 400 hours and they have a breakdown of maybe 120 in DECON and all the other areas have their required hours. Um, our school district would not require us to have hours particularly, but we do have to cover all aspects of SPD in the classroom and then in our rotation. So uh, each of us have 12 students maximum in our classes. So with three classes, that's 36 students. And um, yeah, we, we just don't meet the 400 uh, hour requirement because of uh, they can't get that many with their academics. So we, we've gone with another organization, the other certifying organization, because um, 
we don't have a number of hours that are required. This is what we require. Great, and I have a couple of questions about transportation methods. How did you determine that the best way to travel to the hospital was by yellow school bus? Well, the hospitals won't let you drive your personal vehicle. <laughs> so we, we require all the students to go on the bus and that's how they want us to travel. All right, and yes, this is from a, a different- limited. Oh, go ahead. Limited, park, limited parking yeah. in um, a busy medical center area. I, I'm not sure how we would get everyone there if we went piecemeal. So it's very convenient that we can go all together on the bus. Here's a follow-up to that question from one of the attendees. How do you have the funding for the bus trips? Our Career and Technology Education Department funds all of this, even the certification tests. That's fantastic. I love to hear that there's that support. Yes. Uh, switching gears a little bit, what approach did you take to ask the local hospitals if they could support your students with real life SPD clinical experiences? We went over and met with them and um, laid out uh, what we foresaw as the what the students would, you know, what we needed them to do, what the certification requires them to do. And we've just, I've, I had a huge relationship with the VA hospital prior to this. So they already knew me uh, and um, how we got into university is they actually called us. They heard from the chief of voluntary or the chief of sterile processing at VA and they called us and asked us if we could meet with them because they heard we had a great program and they wanted to get in on that too. So that's how that happened. <laughs> And we've had another hospital here in San Antonio ask if we could work with them, but they are farther away. And so we're lucky that we have the double blocked classes. So for instance, we go from about 9.15 to about 11.45. I mean, we would arrive at 9.15, traffic willing, and everyone had the shirt tucked in and et cetera. So we are we don't go for just an hour change clothes and come back we are there for the morning and that's because our travel time from the beginning of the slides you see we're only six minutes away so it's very i guess purposely this school was built to learn about health careers in a very medical centered area and so we're very fortunate that we can take advantage of two teaching hospitals that wish to help the next generation of students learn these right. type of skills. That is awesome. I love to hear that. Uh, one attendee wanted a follow-up or just clarification. You mentioned career and technology department. Was this school-based or was it medical center-based? It's school-based. In Texas, there are, I think, 11 different career and technical education programs. There's construction, there's architecture, cosmetology, fashion, the hospital, I mean, the uh, food, the chefs, uh, the, culinary the culinary arts, yes, the agriculture, and then health science is one of the 11. And out of the health science, SPD, yeah. Uh, falls under that. So that's what Texas has for uh, career and technical education. And we're kind of one of the kind program. I'm, uh, we've been trying to get the word out to other schools, uh, you know, to look into something like this uh, because, um, you know, we do offer a service at the hospital. I know today we went and uh, just in that we were only there an hour and a half and we put together five trays. Oh wow, that is great. Uh, I have I have an attendee here that is asking about your success rate. How many students graduate yearly with the certification? How many obtain jobs directly with the facilities that you use in rotation? And how many students can be comfortably trained um, at one time in each facility? I can take that last question um, first, if you don't mind. So our school district would like us to have 12 students in a class. 
Um, sometimes that's a lot to be in one spot in SPD. So at my facility at university, uh, the one student will be in the OR, two students can be in endoscopy, um, and I can then have the rest in SPD with two in decon, two in assembly, I have logistics. Um, that works out very nicely. We don't overwhelm any one area, and then we would rotate five different times from October till May. So that was the third question of how many, and you have different places to put them. Right. We have, we have, can take a maximum of 36 total in the program. We figured out that it's just too hard to find to, uh, there's too many places and we want to keep the focus on sterile processing. So we don't take more than 12 per class, but we have 35 students this year. Um, and so far we have 30 who have passed the test. So, um, and about, mm, what would you say? 10 might, might get jobs, 10 to 12. It's growing. It, some students move out of Texas to go to college. Some students join the military. Some students um, would like to work PRN if that's possible. We have um, several students have already interviewed at local hospitals for PRN summer jobs and they would love to work full time, but they're also going to be going to college. So they're trying to work and go to college at the, the very same time. And I have forgotten the first two questions. Sorry. I no, I, I believe they were addressed. Uh, how many oh, were okay. graduating through this and how many were securing jobs at facilities? Yes. Oh, good okay. then. Good job. Good job. Well, uh, there's, a couple of <laughs> there's a couple of questions uh, that several attendees are asking us, so um, I want to address those quickly. Yes, today's presentation was recorded. It will be available on ortoday.com forward slash webinars within 24 hours. You'll be able to view this entire presentation again. Um, also, there are a few attendees that are chatting that they're interested in starting programs like this in their state, and they've provided contact information. So, ladies, I'm going to send that over to you after the webinar. Uh, That'd be we great. Have, we have time for a few more questions. How difficult was it to establish a working relation with your healthcare facilities? How hard? Well, <laughs> I think part of it is it's not hard. You have to do some talking, uh, sit down with the people at the hospital. You, I think you have to prove yourself as being a valuable program, and then the word gets out. It's starting to get out now where they're calling us, you know, to start a program. And that's really what we're trying to achieve here is that we establish a um you know, precedents in the hospital that we're valued and that we do provide a service to the hospitals and we can provide training to those facilities. And you might have at your hospitals, you may have um, a dental clinic, you may have interventional radiology, you may have um, the orthopedic clinic like Miss mm -hmm. Austin has, other areas that you can put students also. I think the idea would be to try to rotate through work areas and through um, units that use surgical instruments or scopes or there's so many things um, you could potentially even probably work in like the ER. It depends how your instruments are processed. And then the people that you are asking, if you come with a program and an idea of time and you have to figure out how are you going to get your scrubs, what personal belongings do you bring, uh, who is accountable for what, how do you get through with occupational health um, issues such as you've had your flu shot and you don't have uh, tuberculosis. All of those things um, need to be worked out and that's how we tried to put this program together was the steps that are taken with all of those legal requirements and mm -hmm. medical requirements and then everyone is comfortable that your students are safe, their patients are safe, and that students are learning something. Right. We let the attorneys for Northside handle the affiliation agreement and they uh, they get that um, between the hospital and the Northside agreement. 
they iron those things out and then we iron out the particulars about where the students are going to go how do they get their scrubs how do we turn them in so that we're responsible we don't have a loss of scrubs uh, for the facility so we're responsible for that and then how they get in there and how they work um, and I think that that is kind of ironed out with each department and we just do a lot of talking and networking with our departments a lot and we cannot have substitute teachers take them into the facilities if um, for some reason we're not here then they remain on campus Great. Two more questions before we wrap up today. But again, attendees, remember, I'm going to send all of your questions over to our presenters. Uh, ladies, how are these students in a typical high school, a STEM or charter or vocational school? This is a magnet high school. Uh, for public. Student, yeah, public. It's public education, but it's a magnet public school, okay, which means that we have higher expectations for our students. Uh, than in regular public school, but it is publicly funded. And um, and we have, um, you know, different requirements. Perfect. Last question that we have time for today. How did you get the training equipment and instruments used at the school? Well, when I got here in 1990, it was already here. Uh, the teacher that had the program before me was a surgical nurse and she was teaching all these skills and I just took up the gauntlet. <laughs> uh, the sterilizer was already here, the ultrasonic cleaner, the uh, now the scrub sink, we only had a single scrub sink and I got a double scrub sink. We have an operating room table. Uh, so we had all the equipment here um, and things to wrap with. I've just built on that, you know, so to offer more skills, more things for our students so they're better prepared when we get over there. And instruments are donated to us, yeah. um, which is really great because they may, they may not be functional for real use, but they are certainly good for identifying things. And they're great for, is this box lock broken? Because we have, mm -hmm. um, we, have uh, broken. <laughs> we had a, a new teacher grant and Healthmark helped us in getting different magnifying and lit magnifying devices. And we were able to study things like, is this chipped or broken? Or um, we even have a camera we don't quite have a boroscope, but they certainly do at the facilities. And so uh, sometimes things are donated to us when it comes to the handheld instruments. Well, ladies, I know this presentation has definitely resonated with our attendees today, just based off of the number of people that are chatting their details for more information from you offline. So. Thank you for a great webinar, and I certainly want to give another thanks to our sponsor, Microsystems. Uh, just a reminder, you can learn more about Microsystems by visiting their website, mmmicrosystems.com. Uh, one lucky attendee today is going to win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey. The survey is going to appear on your screen shortly, right after we close out today's presentation. If for some reason you do not see today's survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. For information on our upcoming OR Today webinars, please visit our website, ortoday.com forward slash webinars. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and make it a fantastic week. See you back soon, guys. Thank you. I don't know if we...